All right. Good afternoon, everyone. This um, it's four oh one. Maybe we we'll get started so we can all leave at five or so. Um, um, again, this uh, I'm Narsima Irinki, I'm the chapter president for Silicon Valley, and welcome to all. Um, I'm uh, actually joining from home, so I just don't have my camera on right now. Normally, I'm on the camera, so. Um, but that's uh, hopefully it should be okay. Um, so I have a quick agenda. So again, thank you all for taking time. So just quick introductions. We'll do a just round, go around just so, you know, your name and your company, uh, what you do. And uh, so that way we all know each other. And then uh, I have some um, local chapter updates, ASHI updates, and then we'll turn over to our presenter. We have a wonderful speaker today, John who is going to give us information on the uh, most important reliable topic, public safety, power shutoffs, and then uh, backup power solutions for uh, with the, um, the microgrid solutions. So, so, uh, so, uh, so we'll be busy next in an hour or so. So with that, um, I want to, I see, well, who I see on the screen, um, then I'll go to go around that based on the names or what I who I see. I see Beth, so maybe Beth will start off with you. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Beth Demeter, and I am the program administrator for CSHE, uh, and I work out of the state office with Joyce Jones. It's Thank good you, to Beth. see all of you today. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Charlene. Hi, my name is Charlene Boudreaux. I'm with Health and Safety Resources in California. Oh, great. Thank you, Charlene. And now we have John. Hi, I'm John Griffiths. I'm uh, your, your co-presenter. I'm an electrical engineer here with Contact, and we're uh, based up in here in, in Marin. Thank you, John. Dan Richards. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Dan Richards with Ideal. I'm accompanied also by uh, with Ryan Henson and uh, uh, healthcare organizations turn to us when they're dealing with a either IAQ issue or a incident involving water um, molds. You know all the all the things that that uh, disrupt property operations uh, to come in and, and get that cleaned up for them. Nice to be here and nice meeting everyone. Thank you, Dan. Which uh, I sorry I missed the company name. Which the company name? Ideal restoration. Ideal restoration. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Then we have, let me see, uh, Ryan. Hi, I'm Ryan Bliss. I'm with Charge Bliss. I'm, I'm presenting today with John. Uh, we develop renewable energy microgrids specifically focused on uh, healthcare facilities. Great. Thank you, Ryan. Mm -hmm. TJ. Hi, thank you, you, Narsima. Good, thank yeah. you. Um, I'm TJ O'Brien. I'm the Northeastern Chapter Secretary of the Sacramento area. If anyone uh, hasn't been to a Northeastern Chapter event, um, please uh, join us. The Silicon Valley as well is, is very good as well. I uh, currently work for Blue Sky Restoration. We're a large uh, nationwide restoration contractor. I'm the regional representative for healthcare covering all of Northern California. Great, thank you, TJ, and great to see you in Boston. Thank you. Yes, yeah. it was. <laughs> um, Glenn. Hi, uh, I'm Glenn Green. I'm with Holt of California. I'm the Central Valley Chapter Secretary. Uh, I've been with Caterpillar for uh, 35 years now and uh, uh, looking forward to hearing the presentation tonight. I'm thinking it's probably going to uh, be buffering for uh, October um, Northern California Institute uh, on the microgrids and uh, backup power. Right. That's right. Thank you, Ryan. Now, then we'll go. To, thank you, Glenn, actually. Uh, Ryan? Oh, I think you already did me. <laughs> oh, no, Ryan. We have another Ryan. Ryan. Yeah. Uh, hey, everybody. Yeah, I'm uh, Ryan. I work with Dan. He already gave us a nice intro, but work with Ideal Restoration. I'm a partnership manager. So I uh, work with all of the facilities here in the, the Greater Bay Area. Nice to meet everybody. Good seeing everyone. Yeah. Great. That's a, that's a real background, by the way, which I'm impressed. <laughs> Ryan's at the golf course. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't get to play, but it's nice sitting out here. <laughs> mm. All right, go to Phil. How are you, Phil? Hello, I'm fine. 
Good to see you, Nashima. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, my name is Phil Harrigan. I'm with uh, the LA chapter. I'm the chapter vice president and uh, glad to join you. And yeah. you're with um, which, um, hospital, right? So which one? I'm with uh, Providence St. John's in Santa Monica. Yeah, there you go. Thank you, Phil. And it was good to see you in Lake Tahoe. <laughs> yeah. All right, Bernard. Good afternoon, Bernard Britz. I'm the Director of Sales with Forensic Analytical Consulting. And I know most of you guys on this call and I always enjoy coming to this meeting. Great, thank you, Bernard. Phil, uh, no, not Phil, sorry, Bob. Hi, Bob Hostetler with Granger. We uh, supply products and services to keep hospitals running and personnel and, and uh, patients safe. All right. Great, good to see you all, and yep, good likewise. To you're back, yeah, that's great. Um, it's you, Marvin. Hey, good afternoon. How are you? Good, uh, Marvin. How are you? Good, good. Marvin Simon, HCA Healthcare uh, um, Facilities Management for HCA, um, covering Northern California now Southern California. So, um, glad to be here today. Yeah, thank you, Marvin. And Marvin is our chapter vice president. So, so thank you. All right, um, Isaac. Hello, all. Uh, my name is Isaac Wagner. I'm the account manager for Phygenics. I'm currently located in South San Jose in the uh, Bay Area. So, thank you guys for having me. All right, thank you, Isaac. Melissa? Hi. I'm Melissa Fernandez. Um, I'm the emergency manager at Adventist Health Florida Memorial Hospital. I am new to CC and part of the Central Valley. So just wanted to join on. Thanks for having me. Great, welcome to Silicon Valley chapter. Thank you for joining. Um, Elena. Hi, I'm Elena Trujillo, and I am a customer relationship manager with PG&E. Um, I help manage our healthcare customers throughout our PG&E territory. Perfect. Welcome, Elena. Thank you. Or, yeah, thank you. Or home. I think we have or home. All right. Good. Oh, yeah. hey, hey, Narsima, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, hi. Um, thanks for having me. I am uh, Par Mustadi with Sizer Co., uh, account manager that oversees energy conservation measures, building automation um, and maintenance for building automation systems in the healthcare vertical. Thanks for having me. Yeah, good to see you. All right, um, Paul. Hi, I'm Paul Sanogi. I work with Glenn Green at Fulton, of California, the Caterpillar dealer. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining. James? Everyone, James Tucker here from Peterson Power Systems, the Peterson Cat Dealer, Caterpillar Dealer. Right. Thank you, James. Angela? Oh, we go to John. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, John Abraham, Chief Engineer at Kaiser uh, Medical Center in Redwood City. Hey, John, thank you for taking time. Of course. Yeah. Jeff? Jeff Russell. Yeah, oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, there you go. My name is Jeff from Holt, California. I work with uh, Paul and Glenn Green from uh, in the Central Valley. Oh, welcome, Jeff. And Kristen. Hi, my name is Kristen Burke. I'm with pg and &E. I serve as a strategic account manager on the healthcare account management team working with Elena, um, work very, very closely and have since inception of public safety power shut off with many uh, large hospitals within high fire risk areas, um, working towards resiliency solutions. So very excited to hear uh, John and Ryan's presentation today. Perfect, thank you for joining. Um, I think we have Rich. Hey, Narshima, good to see you out in Boston. Um, yeah. this, is, this is Rich Park. I'm with ATG, work with hospitals and facilities on compliance, life safety drawings, um, joint commission and DNV 
survey consulting, uh, space management, and um, other facility solutions. Thank you for having me. Great. Thank you, Rich. Good to see you. Um, so did I miss anyone? Hey, yeah, this, Matt, is... Matt, uh, this is Matt Cantor on the call, pg &E. Hi, everybody. Hey, I'm on the, the, P, the account management team with Kristen and Elena supporting healthcare customers. Um, so nice to see everybody. Yeah. Great. And you Thank also you. got Ethan Halimi on the call, Unison Energy, Director of Business Development. And we design, build, own, and operate microgrids for hospitals oh. and healthcare facilities. Excellent. Thank you, Ethan. Then we also have uh, Connor Frazier here. I'm with HTA Architects and Engineers on the design side. Um, this is my first CICHI meeting, but I've uh, been a part of some of the national ASHI uh, operations in the past. So glad to be joining this group. Thank you. Perfect. All right. I think since we have a good topic and mm -hmm. uh, we've lost some time, so I'm going to go quickly on the agenda so we can focus. It's a good topic. Really want to get to the all of the slides and have all the questions answered. Um, so uh, this is too, typical for us to go through the um, updates. And you know, I I want to repeat again the 40 in our annual institute was in Lake Tahoe was excellent. So, um, we had like two more than 250 people attend. Um, I know this is the first time we tried in the last two years, uh, but it was successful. Um, so I'm sure we're going to continue on, um, build up on this. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of, uh, we had some some hesitancy, but I think we had a very good uh, conference. So that was really good. And a lot of good topics, uh, good vendor show. So uh, thank you all who are su supported and uh, will be supporting CISH in the future. So thank you for that. We have great seminars coming up, Southern California, Northern California. We got the dates here. Long one in Long Beach and one in Fairfield. So get in touch with Beth and Joyce for any any sponsorships or vendors, booths, things like that. Uh, I think we may have all the presentations lined up. Uh, so again, uh, one day seminars. Um, so so that's coming up. Um, we have our second quarter e bulletin published. Um, uh, please take a look at they always bring those topics, current topics, uh, president's message and some some important ASHI updates. So please um, read through that and provide any suggestions. Um, we had an ASHI Platinum Award. Um, our chapter always uh, does meet those requirements with ASHI um, uh, with respect to webinars and uh, uh, networking opportunities. We track those, we submit to ASHI and the, uh, we got that Platinum Award. So. I'm sure we'll continue on that. Um, Tom Peterson, uh, one our chapter treasurer, I mean, sorry, state treasurer, uh, won the ASHI Regional Award from California, from Region 9. So that's that's great news. Uh, congratulations to Tom. Um, we actually increasing the number of educational webinars. We had a CHA webinar on May 11th on the, um, um, trying to remember that one was, um, I don't know, that was not the active, the active shooter is coming up on September 2nd. Um, uh, then we had the TJC webinar. That was a highlight. We had uh, more than 70 people attend that seminar, uh, webinar from TJ uh, Joint Commission. Uh, wonderful presentation by Herman McKenzie, the engineering director at Joint Commission. So he went through the standards and latest updates and a lot of good questions came up. So. So we're, we're trying to improve our um, presence of the education, providing the best to our members. And of course the uh, affiliate uh, members, you know, who, who also benefit from these webinars. So um, from Silicon Valley chapter updates, membership, we have 43 facility engineer, uh, sorry, total 43 members. And maybe we may lost one or two, I think 12 facility and affiliated with 31. That's kind of the split you always have. Uh, always a goal to improve that facility members, but um, still, uh, st still uh, an issue um, with the membership. So that's something we're working with the membership chair, trying to improve the membership uh, presence um, within all chapters, not just uh, Redwood City. Um, feature topics, anything that you have interest, uh, you want to present, please uh, send it to uh, Beth and we'll put it in the, uh, our, our, our um, uh, like a collection, you know, we have all the topics and we choose the important topics, current events based on what's happening. Um, we changed to four o'clock. Hopefully that's 
uh, working. We used to have it at three. It was too early. A lot of them asked for four, so we changed to four. Hopefully, that's working better for you all. Um, any member feedback, continue to pro provide that uh, member feedback. Um, Ashi update, uh, as we all said, uh, Boston, we, it was uh, excellent. I mean, I can't believe, I mean, I, I, I attended the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years in, in the, one of the best venues, excellent weather, a lot of, um, uh, you know, facility folks and um, vendor show it was, it was a great, it was great, excellent. So I really liked it. Um, so continue to look forward. I think next one is in San, uh, San Antonio. I think they're coming to Anaheim um, in the next couple of years. I think the next two are, are already set up. So again, take advantage of this. Uh, with that, and then also we have the, on the right side, we have the calendar of events from, for this year. Um, take a look at all the golf tournaments. Um, anything you're interested, please sign up and uh, support uh, CC. So with that, um, I'm going to um, turn it over to our presenter, uh, John. Uh, this is a great topic of <clears throat> interest in, in what's happening. So John, take it away. And thank you very much for taking time. Oh, great. Well, well thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so uh, <clears throat> am I sharing my screen or will I get, uh, I'll grab it back? Yes, it looks great, here. John. Oh, on the third slide, no. Okay, well, we uh, that was a good start, right? We we'll give the show, give the game away here. Bear with me. Let's get back to the start. So, um, <clears throat> well, firstly, I, um, thanks for taking the time this afternoon. I'm sure there's lots of other things you can do, but uh, you know, great, and I'm and I really appreciate doing the introductions. It's great to get a sense of um, where different people are from, different industries, because what I heard is we have. Uh, facilities, you know, I'm an electrical engineer, we have vendors, consultants, PG&E, and, uh, and, you know, facility directors. So hopefully for me, and I, you know, hopefully speak for Ryan as well, who I'm going to present with it. I've sat to, through too many presentations where people just talk at you. I, I much rather comments. There's a lot of collective knowledge. We certainly don't have all the answers. So, um, there's something that you feel that we said or you disagree with or have a different perspective, um, please let me know. <clears throat> and, me. and on that, feel feel free to throw something in the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on the chat and I'll stop John if a question comes up or a comment. Right, right. And I and I I'm from Bristol in England, so if you have trouble um, understanding what I say, I actually have a um, I have a um, I have a, 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 a Bristol dictionary here ready, so I can do translations. Um, all right. So with that, that being said, um, so again, public safety power shutoffs, PSPS, and I um, we've spoken, a, presented a couple of times to the Sishi um, um, groups, it's Northern Southern California, um, but you know we sort of we put a lot of work into this, trying to make, adapt it to you know what we think are the challenges and what we're seeing. You know, at contact, we're we're an electrical engineering consultant. I'm an electrical engineer, a PE. Was an electrician many years ago, so bring a hopefully a broad perspective to this, and then um, I'm also presented with Ryan Bliss here. I'm Ryan Bliss. I'm with Charge Bliss. Uh, we develop renewable energy microgrids for hospitals around California. Uh, we'll we'll show you a couple examples later on in the presentation. Great. Well, thank you, Ryan. Um, so that all being said, you know, so agenda, so. I just want to run through the you know power continuity challenges and update it based on my view of the world. <clears throat> you know, what are the solutions of backup power? Other factors to consider. You know, current and future sustainable hospital microgrids. And I'm also a member of the Hospital Building Safety Board, so um, I can give an update on the HKI uh, microgrid task force. Jamie, who's the electrical engineer who's leading that um, was going to join, but um, with the new date, he's actually in Croatia. So with that, let's jump in. Um, so, you know, I guess, you know, why are we here? I, you know, I, I guess the first PSPS we had was um, back in, uh, you know, uh, 2020, uh, 2019, you know, that was a major event. And now, you know, after that, we thought we got through that and then we continue to have dry spells and then, <clears throat> excuse me, and then, we got hit with COVID. So we've got a lot of challenges. I say we as the you know, engineers, facilities, and everybody, all the stakeholders in providing power to healthcare. And you know, 
from my view of the world, you know, each time I did this presentation, I added one of these slides, you know, and now we're you know, more heat stress. And then, you know, we just kept going on with the dry spells. And then, you know, we're dealing with the uh, staff. Hello, staffing Bob shoot. speaking. Hi, sorry, what was that? Okay, yeah, I'll keep going. Um, so yeah, anyway, which, my point here is just, you know, this originally was talked about public safety power shutoffs, but I think just we're dealing with other challenges that would impact and require us to look for other power solutions. Um, and I guess the last one I found this when preparing for this is really, you know, is it the new reality? You know, I'm an optimist, but you know, we have to prepare solutions, deliver solutions um, for, you know, traditionally hospitals were designed in California for major seismic event. And that is one event that's sort of been superseded by a lot of these other others, although that's an ever present danger. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what has changed since 2019? And great to see uh, Matt. I, Matt, I know we worked together, um, a number of representatives from PGE. <clears throat> uh, I got a slide from the Hospital Council. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I guess back in 2019, this is an update. You know, there was no, when the PSPS is, there was a lot of uh, hospitals impacted, up to 28 were at risk. 2021, that went down to 18. And now, uh, well, numbers I have, it's two, uh, 10 hospitals at risk, yet for each of the hospitals, there's a, a mitigation plan in place. Um, I know uh, I actually drove past one this morning uh, in Sausalito. I know pg &E, feel free to speak up if you have updates on what you're doing um, in front of the meter. But um, you know, there's been a lot of work done on these, uh, these facilities. <clears throat> so, I guess in, what does that mean for our presentation? You know, before it was PSPS, it was a you know a lot of facilities. However, what I take away from this is this is just eye occupancy. There was a lot we were talking before the meeting that you know, a lot of healthcare is delivered through uh, ambulatory surgery centers and medical office buildings that um, are not included in this. Um, so you know, moving on, you know, originally we started this as a public safety shelves were a uh, <clears throat> You know, way of reducing fire risk in the uh, you know in the high winds, but you know I pulled this from the HKI operations website where you can overlay all the all the risks in all the facilities. But you know, Ryan and I were talking about this before. You know, it went from uh, are you in a high risk area to you in a risk area, and I think um, you know I was just looking at the map here. I'm not sure where the this chapter's. Um, you know, facilities are, but you know, if you're Santa Cruz Mountains, certain these other areas. I'm in Northern in Marin. You know, there's a lot of facilities in this um, tier two level. But you know, we've also got the ever-present seismic uh, challenges. And I'll say the map. The map's uh, a little misleading because you know most of the hospitals don't actually land in the colored high fire threat areas. But just because the facility is not shown in that area, you know, uh, adjacent fires can still have major effects on those facilities. Right. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, that's a, anyway, so we just want to, I've sat through a couple of these presentations and I just, and we're trying to make, keep this, keep this current, but that's a great point. Um, so, you know, we'll talk about backup power solutions. You know, I, I been on, on boots on the ground with a couple of these, you know, we start off, you lose the power, what's going on, you know, you have somebody in the ER. So, you know, what, what solutions can we bring? <clears throat> I'm an electrical engineer, right? You know, the first thing is just go back, what does the code require? Uh, you know, and chap 517, you know, clearly defines in an eye occupancy the the branches and the configuration and you know what's what needs to be connected to it. But for me, you know, and then the facility engineers feel free to speak up, but it's a code minimum. You know, I've been in a hospital when you've lost power and just have code minimum uh receptacles and HVAC and it's I think it's 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 quite a challenge to uh, keep that facility operational particularly with all the technology and in, in health, uh, delivering health care. Hey John we have a comment from Kristen Berg at PG I'm just going to read it real quick okay. she says uh, the facilities may also be served by a transmission source that is in a high fire risk area uh, even if their facility is not putting them at risk for being impacted by a PSPS event. Great well thank you thank you Kristen. <clears throat> So, um, yeah, so there's sort of keeping keep going, you know, so my point here is when, and again, I'm, you know, 
yes, your hospital may be meet code, but you know, is that best for the way you operate your facility? You know, is it when we look at you know when Contech and you know when we work with Charge Bliss, we look looking for e backup power solutions. It would is it short term, long term? You know, I think a couple of years ago we were looking at facilities providing solutions to provide five days. Um, I think just from my view of the world, the backup power that's somewhat reduced, but again with climate change and impact of other challenges, you know, maybe that's the right duration. You know. Do you want to operate when you're looking at the solutions? Do you want to operate at business as normal, reduced? You know, um, we were talking earlier again, you know, vaccines, you know, you know, in eye occupancy hospitals, yes, you have the backup power, but in the medical office buildings, you know, we have lots of expensive and critical vaccines and samples that need to be maintained through a power outage and with lots of other things. Um, so you know what, so that all being said, those are the challenges. And we look to, and if there's anything else you think of a power need that those in the audience of I think I've overlooked please put in the chat so solution you know is it fixed generator portable generator UPSs you know solar battery you know from a sustainable micro grid um or you know fuel cell or other DERs and then I realize I don't have an acronym distributed energy resource um <clears throat> now I think we'll hear that a lot certainly when you're looking at uh other power solutions for well, any building and any solution. So what is that? What is that right solution? So um, in jumping into solutions, and I hope I'm, I'm trying to talk quickly and clearly, because uh, I know we've got a lot of slides to get through here in uh, 30 minutes. So first thing is optional transfer switch. You know, generators, when we design to, uh, we electrical engineers meeting code, there's a lot of spare capacity. So really simple thing is to install an optional transfer switch and then when, when you've met all the available loads, equipment, life safety, and critical, then you can close this transfer switch. And the probably the last five major healthcare projects I've been the electrical engineer record for, we've, we've delivered this. And this adds a lot of value. So um, other solutions, you know, the quick connect, this is actually required by code. Um, you know, I, I drive past facilities, seeing the board at a dead front pulled off and the the cables going in. I know none of these facilities, anybody on this call would do that, but you know, this buys you a lot of, uh, I think, a lot of peace of mind for um, connecting backup generators, or if it's a non-essential facility, you know, connecting your generator when you need to do that. Um, other things that I just shared from my, my, my electrical engineering experiences, we see backup power solutions, seeing a lot of these temporary generators and, uh, you know, I'm sure you're all very familiar with this on this call, but, you know, I think it's always great to see when you have the temporary generators on the trailer, and I should have it in here. Uh, HKI have actually updated the CAN, I think it's 2-108, that better defines the requirement for temporary generators. It's it's given a lot more latitude to the um, to the facilities and the area compliance officer, because um, they know there's a lot of these facilities being installed. But really, takeaways. This is great. Um, cables laid out. You know, it looks pretty, but it's important. You know, sometimes I've, other facilities I've seen the the temporary cables coiled up. You know, often are in the sun, and I've actually known a couple of instances where this is running at full load in the sun. These overheat, and you lose your generator, and then accessibility and just obvious things. But you know, sometimes these things are installed. You know, in a hurry and a temporary situation, and you must not lose sight of. Um, basic good practice because uh, it's there to provide power and often um, emergency power. So in terms of top generator issues, um, you know, we're going to talk about sustainable microgrids and renewables, but, um, you know, most of the uh, facilities and people here, there's going to be generators. So I called um, preparing this, I called uh, Brian Pumphrey from Cummins, and I, I'm glad there's a couple of people here from uh, CAT. Feel free to, if there are other ones, I said, Brian, What's the top three issues that uh, keeping you awake at night or your phone going? So those are lead times, emissions, and pricing. <clears throat> so uh, slightly out of this, and then again, you know, I'm, I think we're, I haven't met an industry, somebody delivering facilities are, are not dealing with lead times, but I'm being told by Brian that, you know, over a megawatt, you know, we are looking at 70 weeks, less than a megawatt, you know, 45 to 56. You know, and they're dealing with the impact of uh, Cobra 
COVID labor impacts, but also increased demand, you know, uh, really driving the um, lead times for generators. So facility, people looking at a generator, you know, I keep telling people don't delay. Uh, and the other thing is emissions compliance. I'll come on to that. Um, the next slide, and then inflation, you know, and hearing generators are 30% up on what they were pre-COVID. So um, <clears throat> emissions. And now before I jump in and try and articulate this, uh, Brian, are you on the on the meeting? I knew we were going to try and call. I didn't see you come up. Uh, okay. All right. Well, sorry. And any other generator people, um, feel free to chime in. Now, this... For me, you know, emissions, why is that important in this discussion? So in the Bay Area or California, um, ARB, you're, they're mandating uh, tier four compliant generators. Uh, now, I think uh, Bay Area Air Quality District, uh, Sacramento, and a number of other air quality districts are mandating that. So what does that mean for us on this call? So you know, other generators, I think I have in the background here, I have a link to the EPA tier is that, uh, you know, tier four was traditionally reserved for prime generators that were running all the time. Uh, and this is tier, this is part, uh, related to the emissions. So if you're delivering a generator now in the Bay Area and you, it's over 600 kilowatts, which is probably a lot of them, uh, your choices are to be it certified or compliant with tier four. And this is a bit of a nuance, but I, I thought I would share in this, in this presentation. So if it's certified, it comes off the truck, it's a you know, cut sheet package unit, and we'll have a deep diesel particulate DPF, um, and we'll also have SCRs uh, in part of it. Um, whereas in a compliance system, that can be a tier two set with the uh, site installed DPF and SCR. So what's, what's the important part about these differences? So if you have a certified set, um, and I'm not and please anybody on this facility, and I'll be honest, I wasn't aware of this requirement until preparing this presentation is to meet the um, emissions, you need a urea injection. So uh, in addition, you know, I know a lot of people, if you have diesels, uh, diesel cars, you have that. Um, what's the big difference here? So um, in a compliance system, which could be a tier two uh, retrofitted set, you need an air compressor, other things you need to think about. You also need to do testing, annual testing of the urea, which you can do at the same time as you do the diesel. Uh, but the big one here is if you have a urea, part of the tier, tier requirements is that if you have, um, if the urea system um, goes bad, runs out, um, after an hour, it will shut down. And after four incidents, the unit will shut down and you'll need a certified tech to restart it. I'm not sure the rights or wrongs of that on emergency power system, but you know this is something to be aware of when you're evaluating different systems. Mm. All right, so fuel. Uh, all right, so a generator fuel. You know we have number two diesel traditional solution. You know need, does need scrubbing, but uh, other additional fuels that are uh, you know I'm seeing on on projects. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so renewable diesel. So that is a brand name. There's this is a hyperlink. I won't click on it. Um, it is certified by all major manufacturers, and um, I understand in San Francisco and a couple of other projects this is being used. Um, and I, it's you know, and it doesn't need polishing. Now I assume it doesn't need polishing, but you would still need to do that to meet the NFPA. Um, so that's one alternate fuel source. <clears throat> and then we have uh, biofuel or uh, um, dual fuel blending. Now, <clears throat> you know, what's the benefits of dual uh, by fuel where you have a, a natural gas connection? So you can, when it's running, basically this is going to extend the runtime of your available diesel on site. So if we're in a long PSPS uh, or power outage, um, it's great because you can extend your diesel usage by 40%. Um, again, takeaways from mine is um, I know, oh, dang, sorry, I keep jumping here is that, um, you know, it's it's a warranty. Um, I know uh, people from CAT speak up if I'm um, misquoting, but I understand it's only Generac, who a major manufacturer who certify by fuel systems, all others, it's a retrofit. So again, facilities and engineers and clients, just be mindful of that when you're selecting the by fuel systems. And in natural gas, oh, dang, sorry about this. Um, maybe it's... Uh, jumping here um okay 
Um, so where are we? Yeah, fuel, sorry. So natural gas, um, if you do have that in an essential facility, then um, that's fine. But if it's serving a, um, an essential facility, it needs to be in a seismically compliant compressed natural gas tank. Um, and if anybody's on the line from Bloom, I know they're looking at developing that, um, but these are big, they need a lot of seismic, uh, you know, it's a lower calorific value than diesel, um, just to be considered. And the hydrogen, you know, I'm not aware of any, you know, certainly in the Bay Area or California, um, emergency systems just running purely on hydrogen, but I, I know most of the major manufacturers are developing it. Um, and for me, again, word of, you know, my past life, um, developed a, a white paper on the hydrogen distribution. It's you know storage distribution. Um, it's a volatile liquid. It needs a lot of managing and there are other issues that we should be aware of. So different fuels, if this comes up when you're planning your uh, backup power systems. And, and again, I, I will give a link. There are These are hyperlinks to the various uh, things I'm talking about here. All right. So again, before you select the system, um, you know, other people just go big. Um, other things you should consider. Yeah, so thanks, John. A lot of, lot of good info there. Um, you know, before you go and, and spend a lot of money on a, on a backup system, there's a lot of energy efficiency upgrades you can do to your building just to reduce your base load. Um, that, you know, it's, it's, it still costs money, obviously, but uh, it, it can significantly reduce the size of, of backup system that you'll need, you know, regardless of generation source. Um, and those tend to be much more expensive uh, than energy efficiency upgrades. Um, and uh, uh, other benefits of uh, energy storage power systems. Um, so when you're dealing with a purely renewable microgrid, you know, you're having solar or wind charging a battery. Um, with an, uh, a few years ago, utilities shifted the expensive time of day to 4 to 9 p.m. If anybody's familiar with the duck curve, so it basically your solar is generating earlier in the day, and but it's not producing when your power is most expensive. So with the benefits of energy storage, you can store that renewable generation and discharge it during the most expensive times. That's essentially what load shifting is. Oops, sorry, sorry, Ryan. No worries, but those demand charges on facilities can be 60% of a utility bill uh, and very expensive. Um, and with an energy storage system, you can eliminate, if not nearly eliminate, uh, those costs. Um, I see a comment here. I'm going to jump over there real quick. Um, from Matt Cantor, uh, great to see mention of the loading order, starting with energy efficiency to reduce generation needs. Uh, plug to check in well, with your utility account manager for any incentives or financing opportunities to help with project funding. Uh, th thanks, Matt. Great point. Yeah, utilities do offer uh, a lot of incentives for those uh, efficiency upgrades. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, John was mentioning emissions uh, earlier and, and GHG reporting. Um, that's another benefit with the renewable microgrids is your, your zero emissions. So you're not, you're, you're, not only are you not increasing your site's GHG emissions, you're significantly reducing them because you're no longer having to purchase power from uh, non-renewable sources. Great. Well, thank you, Ryan. Um, and I think Matt, you know, I, I guess one term I haven't used in, you know, as a, as a generator, it's great to provide a solution, but it's a stranded asset. And, you know, certainly with these energy efficiency investment, there are a lot of um, incentives available. That's going to, that's going to reduce your energy 24 um, seven when you're operating. So other, 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 my takeaways, you know, flood risk and, and building codes. You know, a lot of other municipalities, so we have, you know, in the CBC, um, we have a requirement for uh, emergency power systems and generators to be located above, above the, the floodplain, um, but also in NAFPA 110, you know, required to have, um, you know, provide, <laughs> install the systems that are not affected by flooding or firefighting and other things. So. Um, it's always been in a code. Uh, I guess it makes sense. Um, you know, but as an engineer, what does that mean? Um, so it's great. So this is a, an example of a, a new service. It's not a hospital, but just one. We've got a floodplain. What is that floodplain? Let's say you have your switch gear outside. Let's, let's raise the switch gear above, <clears throat> excuse me, 
it's raised it above the floodplain, you know, whatever that determination is. So that puts your switch gear high up. So, but you're gonna, you're gonna need a platform. So, okay, you gotta think about how big that platform is. And again, you know, the higher you raise the switch gear in a site in a seismically compliant building, the bigger the seismic load. So more anchorage uh, requirements you have. And the other thing is if you, you know, from a planning perspective, if you're gonna install a generator, um, you know, on a road or somewhere that's um, visually sensitive, then if you're raising it 10, 12 feet, then you may find that your emergency power system then is subject to planning requirements. And I think most municipalities that can have, you know, quite a schedule impact on um, getting that approved and that cost. All right, so you know, we're throwing a lot of things out there, you know, good, bad, different solutions. Um, and in my experience, you know, when we've been brought into projects, you know, it's, you know, we're pretty good at designing generators and finding a way of adding to buildings without adding cost. But we try to look, evaluate all the different criteria and not just what's wrong is, and I would encourage, you know, anybody on this call or, you know, feel free to reach out to us is just, just look at all the criteria, you know, noise, you know, different things running for five days. That's a real challenge in cost money mitigating and then hazards and operational and other benefits. So um, so term, and I, I firmly embrace it, you know, choosing by advantages um, when, so you, you can make a wise decision. Right. So with that, um, you know, we've got, Ryan's going to pick up here talking about uh, hospital microgrids, but more importantly, there's a lot of microgrids out there supporting hospitals. So he's going to talk about sustainable solutions for hospitals. So with that, Ryan, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, John. So uh, Charge Bliss's focus for a while has been providing uh, renewable microgrid options for hospitals. Uh, so this first one here, the Kaiser Richmond microgrid, this is on the Kaiser facility in Richmond, California. Uh, this was funded by a CEC grant that was awarded to Charge Bliss. Um, and it is a 250 kilowatt solar, one megawatt hour battery microgrid. John, if you wanna go to the next slide. Um, it, it was the uh, first microgrid to be able to connect to the life safety branch of a hospital in California. Uh, it does so via manual transfer switch. Uh, and it's currently in operation. It was commissioned in 2017 uh, and saves roughly 40% of the uh, facility's electric uh, electricity costs every month. Okay. Uh, John can go to the next one now. All right. Uh, so even more exciting, uh, we're currently building this project right now. Uh, this is a 3D rendering we had put together. So this is the next step uh, in um, in incorporation of renewable power at hospitals from the micro from the Richmond project. This is at another Kaiser facility uh, in Ontario, California. Um, again, funded by a, a California Energy Commission grant awarded by Charge Bliss. Um, so where John was just circling his mouse down in the corner there, that's the uh, microgrid yard, so where the batteries and, and other electrical equipment, inverters, switchgear, transformers are all located. Uh, and then you can see scattered on the uh, north northern side of the site, some parking lot solar, uh, canopy solar, and then the entirety of the parking structure roof is covered in solar. So there's, uh, John, if you want to go to the next slide, there's 2.2 megawatts of solar on this project, uh, nine megawatt hours of battery, uh, and then there was one megawatt of existing fuel cell from Bloom on site that we're incorporating into the microgrid. Uh, so you, as you can tell, uh, much, much bigger than the previous system. Uh, this system is meant to provide a minimum of 10 hours of backup power to the hospital, um, which is significant in this case because the, the average load of the, emergency, the, of the uh, full emergency system for this hospital is about two megawatts. Uh, so there's a lot of power going through there. Right. Um, this system also is the first renewable microgrid to automatically connect to emergency power. So the previous microgrid would connect to the life safety branch only via a manual transfer switch. Uh, this microgrid will do so via an ATS uh, and cover the entire emergency system of the hospital. Um, now, technically, uh, we cannot be the first line of defense. They, the diesel generators are still required per NEC code. Um, but we are allowed to significantly reduce them. So there's there's about six megawatts of generator on site right now and uh, between four generators. And so we're allowed to basically cut that down to 
uh, as little as one generator operating during a uh, power outage. Okay. Hey, Ryan, did you want to just touch on the battery technology? Because I often get questions about that because this is pretty yeah. unique, right? Yeah, so the first system was using uh, lithium ion batteries, um, fairly standard. Uh, you, you know, everybody knows about lithium ion, but a little exciting about this Ontario project, these are using a zinc battery. Um, the, the main focus of this grant was to, to demonstrate non-lithium ion technologies for long duration storage. So this is an EOS battery. Um, the, they're, they're, they've been great. The efficiency is not quite as great as a uh, lithium ion, but the long-term discharge capabilities of them are, are much better. And there's zero fire risk with them, <laughs> which is, you know, <laughs> as we're discussing PSPS events, limiting fire risk is, is important. All right, great. Well, thank you, Ryan. And if anybody, I know Ryan, you know, I'm working with a the team there. He's doing a lot of research. So if anybody has questions about different battery technology or these solutions, I, you know, encourage you to reach out to myself or Ryan and charge bliss team. You want to next slide? Yeah, next slide, please. I was just talking a little bit about the economics. Um, so I mentioned earlier demand versus usage, usage charges. Um, so non-residential facilities are paying a demand charge on top of a usage charge. Uh, so essentially how how quickly you need your energy. I use the analogy of, of water flowing. So your usage is uh, how much you fill the bucket and your demand is how fast you fill the bucket. Um, and those charges can be up to 60% of your utility bill. Um, now microgrids, the renewable microgrids can nearly eliminate this cost, if not entirely eliminate this cost. So that chart on the right with the green and red, that is from our Richmond project and it's showing the solar and inverter power um, so the battery and solar are hooked up to the same inverter. So it's a, a little confusing, but you can see the solar is, uh, the green line. And when the solar is active, um, and that's charging the battery initially, and then where the gap between the green and the red are is where the battery's now discharging to cover that peak load. Um, now optimizing time of use saving. So, uh, as, as we mentioned earlier, again, the, the battery during normal operation is great for uh, time shifting your solar to, to utilize it during the most expensive time of day. So what, what you can see in that chart over there um, and even on an even better benefit to uh, using a fully renewable microgrid, when you install the batteries with solar, you qualify for the federal ITC, the investment tax credit on both the solar and the battery. Um, so that's right now for projects anchored in 20, in 2022, that's 26% of eligible costs of the system. Um, and you also get the depreciation benefits. So 100% upfront, um, uh, excuse me, I'm talking too fast over myself. 100% uh, upfront depreciation. So there's very significant uh, financial benefits to this. Um, now I know a lot of hospitals are, are nonprofits. Um, so we actually uh, specialize in helping hospitals circumnavigate this so they can get, they can capitalize on the value of these these tax benefits um the the, the models are a little complex so i can't I won't <laughs> get into them right now but but uh um they, they are a lot of hospitals will think they they won't qualify for those but there are methods to to uh take advantage of those great well thank you ryan um well we must be either people have gone to sleep or we've answered every single question uh, <laughs> um well that's fine. You know, uh, I, you know, for me, I'm an electrical engineer, you know, right? you know, when I first started working with Charge Bliss, uh, however many years ago, so that's great. But what's uh, Oshpot or each guy going to say about it? Um, so what do they say? Um, <clears throat> so I am, um, you know, with Dave, um, with the help of Dave Lockhart, uh, probably about two years ago, we, we got together and really pushing H Kai or Oshpot and said, look, We've got these solutions. We really think these can benefit hospitals and help us get towards a more sustainable and renewable uh, power solutions for healthcare. So we developed um, really, I think quite a few people on this call were part of it, uh, a white paper. And that was published and, and it was a really great community effort. So that is published, it's publicly available. I, I've seen it being used by quite a few people, um, which is fine. That's what it was there for. Um, but after that, the next step is uh, HKI have established a, a task force and it's led by Jamie. Um, and it's uh, got, you know, it's a, a multi, you know, 
Diana Navarro from um, Life Safety, Richard, I know Paul's not there, but and Nancy Timmons. So there's a they're they're developing this uh, task force, and the outcome of that task force is they're going to they are developing a design guide for microgrids. <clears throat> so you know, table of contents, uh, and they're going to publish that. I'm not. I'm. It's pretty well along. I don't have a copy that we can share, um, but for me, what's great about this document is it's a it's a practical document. So James put together a flow chart that addresses. Um, you know, both building types, kind of hard to see on this, but he also has had a, has a uh, code matrix. And again, the first thing, you know, is the code is a minimum, you know, we can't deliver these projects unless we can demonstrate code compliance. Um, you know, HKI, you know, they, they're working under Title 24, the building codes, but they are also, <clears throat> excuse me, they're also uh, part of that group. They have a, a liaison with uh, CMS. So, you know, you know, you can design it, but and we can get it approved. But unless CMS passes licensing, you know, it's not going to work. So that is happening. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say the word excited. I think it will help all of us deliver these solutions. And and kudos to uh, you know HK to support that. So there are the things they're doing. They're looking at seismic certification for the DERs, distributed energy resources. Um, you know, looking at UL. I was going to say the UL is, is a challenge um, and encouraging any facility here if you are evaluating a system, be very mindful of the ULs. It's, you know, it's new, you know, AHJs and various suppliers, it's, it's evolving. It's not like generators, everybody knows what those requirements are. So that, that's evolving. And then um, you know, the on-site storage, you know, they're looking at that, um, you know, knowing how challenging that is, you know, can we include the DERs. And the other point is testing and commissioning, retro commissioning. Yeah. You know, I'm still involved supporting Charge Bliss on the Richmond and involved with, <clears throat> excuse me, Ontario. You know, these systems do are different. You know, they, they work great, but there's a different level of commissioning, retro commissioning, and, and HKI are um, including that in their, uh, in, their, in their guide. So we're coming up on go, Sorry, we have another question here. I'm going to jump in real quick. I, I sorry, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, Param Astadi. Uh, can you please provide some information on the eligibility criteria for commissioning uh, energy grants concerning hospitals? Um, so, uh, first thing is there. There we know there has to be a grant available. We're expecting a big grant, uh, specifically for critical facilities, to be announced in the next month. Um, and then as far as uh, eligibility criteria, it has a lot to do with demographics. The, the California Energy Commission um, likes to go after, or likes to go for facilities that are, are in disadvantaged air quality areas, low income areas, um, you know, high fire threat, PSPS risk areas. Um, and, and so we're, you know, we, we just kind of look around and, and make partnerships with, with hospitals we feel are in, in uh, in, in good areas to, to meet those eligibility requirements just so we can be prepared uh, when a grant does come out. So if, you, if you're interested in, in learning a little more about it, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I believe my email is in the presentation. If not, I'll, I'll put it in the chat here yeah. um, and we can definitely discuss, discuss that more. Right. That's a great point. Actually, Ryan, just building on that, I know, you know funding is a challenge. Um, you know, in, in Charge Bliss, you've got a lot of, uh, you know, your finger on a pulse, as it were, for for grant funding. You know, I know put it out to Sishi. Is that maybe a, a subject for another you know follow up presentation? Um, it's uh, you, know, you can't build it unless you've got the the funding. Um, so um, with that, um, you know, a summary. We're five two. We got four minutes for Q and A. Um, so we just talked about you know power continuity challenges. Gave an update. What are the solutions? Other factors to consider. You know, and thank you, Ryan, for giving a great uh, overview of the two, well, I think the first hospital microgrid in the US and certainly in California, and in the, certainly the biggest and the most sophisticated one we're working on uh, in Ontario. And then, you know, update from HKI um, microgrid task force. So with that, um, any questions? Hey, um yeah, this not seem also. I just um, had a question regarding that manual transfer on the life safety. Um, how is that working? I always thought that it has to be automatic. Um, 
it doesn't meet the NFPA, the class 10 diesel, you know, it, it's not the same. So can somebody quickly speak to that? Yeah, so that that project was a demonstration project for the grant. So um, I, I, then Oshpod, now HKI, wasn't quite ready for having the system be fully integrated via an automatic transfer switch. So um, we agreed on a manual transfer switch just so we could prove for the purposes of the grant and demonstration that this was feasible. And then that, that built on what is now the Ontario project where we are using an automatic transfer switch. Oh, really? Okay. So that's approved. That's an approved method now um, that microgrid can be used as an alternate solution. They can, it's, it's not an alternate to diesels right now. They're considering it a supplementary power source. Um, but uh, NEC is being updated. The 2023 NEC is being updated to essentially eliminate the term backup power and just have power sources. Um, so hopefully by 2025, um, it, it won't be restricted to just diesel for, for the backup power. But right now, it, it has to be supplementary to supplemental. the diesel. Okay, got it. I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, perfect. Yeah. No, good, good. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, Ryan, would it be fair to say, you know, is a demonstration project that, you know, if anybody is uh, interested in seeing it, it's in Richmond. Um, you know, we were going to do a virtual, we did the virtual tour for HKI. Um, you know, we, we're, we're happy and certainly proud to be part of that, showing it. Um, so and we do have a, um, I will say, Char Charge Bliss, we're, we're relaunching our website in the next couple of weeks, and we're going to have some uh, really cool videos and virtual tours of the Richmond site on there. So if, uh, take a look in, in the next two, three weeks, and that'll be up. Great. Thanks, Ryan. I, I just put a link to in the, um, the website here. One thing, and before we uh, wrap up here, I'm going to maybe... The, there's a lot of people here from PG&E and uh, you know, researching this and I've, you know, driving around, I've been made aware that PG&E uh, <clears throat> are installing some large scale uh, prime generators that are coupled with the Tesla power, Tesla battery systems and essentially they're microgrids. And, um, you know, speaking to some of the techs that are delivering those, um, you know, driving past, I, my takeaway was, wow, that's amazing. And so they were great. And I was talking to the tech, um, so that's in front um, in front of the meter. Uh, and I'm thinking if those are six, eight megawatt systems that are coupling batteries with generators, um, you know, maybe we can behind the meter, you know, we can we can utilize that technology or those solutions. And is anybody from PG&E, maybe Matt Cantor, that can talk to that? What uh, PG&E are doing in in, um, in front of the meter? Well, I don't know if I can speak intelligibly, John. Um, most of our work or our all of our work is directly with customers. So some of the grid scale stuff, we just kind of see, you know, on the periphery um, a little bit. It's hard to get into the weeds on that stuff. Um, maybe referring to like the Moss Landing installation, which I believe was in the uh, 300 megawatt range, if that's right. what, the one you're referring to. And there are is definitely a drive to, um, to you know, to commission a number of these sites to meet some of the peak demand issues um, related to you know, capacity constraints with all um, with everything we're facing with um, uh, you know ri rise in uh, you know increase in renewables needing that that um, uh, that you know to cover the gap in peak there so. Yeah, not speaking intelligently about it. Okay. Uh, just, just um, can acknowledge that we are. Great. Uh, we are doing that. So I don't know if anyone yeah. else, if Kristen or or Elena, want to add anything to that. No, um, I think that we're in the same boat as you, Matt. Like seeing it from from the background and hearing um, good news about it. I I do know that we're always looking for opportunities to, uh, you know. Uh, help with new technologies and do things like that to help support the grid um, along with the demand response programs that we're starting to offer as well. So I, I expect to see more of these uh, types of projects in the future. All right. Well, great. Well, well, one you. thing that I could also add is just um, the, you know, the support of the state and the utility programs supporting microgrids that are 
that are um, currently active and are expected to be active soon, like the community microgrid enablement program, and then a future microgrid incentive program. So, um, you know, if you have questions about any of those utility funded programs, um, or ratepayer funded programs, you can, you know, we can, we can take that offline if you want to reach out okay. to your account reps or for future discussion. Yeah. Can you put that information in the chat? Um, I know, it, or maybe Matt, or where the you know people on this call could reach out from that. Yeah, I can put a link to the the community microgrid incentive program, the CMEP program, or I guess the CMEP, <laughs> and okay. then um, and then there's a um, uh, there are you know filings for the microgrid incentive program, which is you know. TBD on when that is going to be launched or what the program design looks like, but okay. I can drop some relevant links in the chat. Great. I think that was part of a Cal ISO deal in the last couple of years to start moving towards something like that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. We're, we're, we're at five past uh, five here. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to stay on. I know you probably all got lives and emails and projects to deal with. Um, you know, um, is there any, anybody else here? What about the facilities? You know, we've been talking a lot. Um, what's the biggest challenge you're seeing right now in terms of uh, keeping the lights on? Um, well, I'd, I'd like to make a comment. Uh, your presentation, your and Ryan's presentation was fantastic tonight. Uh, a lot of great information. Uh, and one of the challenges too that I see is is early on, uh, you know, just before fire season, uh, facilities that are, you know, could be needing backup generators. Early on, uh, the industry is is uh, deleted as far as all the generators go out. In fact, part of PG&E's uh, contracts is to uh, uh, rent as much as they can so they can distribute them to uh, specific grids and a lot of our hospital grids. So that, that is a, another challenge as far as uh, keeping the lights on. Right. And they're expensive. <laughs> Those big generators are expensive to rent. Yes. Yeah. Um, what about, um, sorry, Glenn, which organization are you with? I'm with uh, Caterpillar um, oh. in the Central Valley. Great. Well, thank you. And then, yeah, well, you know, if a facility or, you know, they're concerned, what, what, what should they do? You know, because I've been told, you know, when I... Uh, is have a plan if you need to, you know, yes. figure out where you're going to put the generator, where you're going to put the walkways, just the really basic things. Um, yeah. and the, tap, the tap cans uh, are, are are fantastic. You know, the industry has been slow coming into installing tap cans unless it's new facilities or a new central plant going in. Uh, but but everything so that it can meet all the wash pod requirements for a long-term rental being uh, installed. It has to be secured. It has to have seismic. It has to have a uh, remote enunciation. There's so many things that go from, if it's a three-day rental to a 10-day rental to a 30-day rental. And so the, the more prepared they can be for that, that uh, temporary power to be rolled in and quickly hooked up. Uh, but the other side of that is the availability right now of that temporary power being because uh, right now during fire season, uh, I mean, everything in our yard uh, is gone. Uh, so if they call tomorrow and say, hey, we're going to have a power outage, uh, you know, we have, you know, we have a few that we keep, but, but the majority of our fleet is, is rented out uh, for the fire season. Right, right. Yeah. I encourage the, the hospitals, if it's Kaiser or if it's uh, Sutter, you know, maybe get together and say rent one, two megawatt for themselves so they can move it around to different facilities and not have to keep it at one facility to where they might need it uh, through the season. Adventist Health, you know, all the facilities. So just a good idea. Yeah, no, that's great. Um... But, you know, one thing, Glenn, I, I, I'm aware from, um, you know, talking to some of the techs who are doing the, uh, in front of the meter setup, they, there are uh, trailer mounted batteries, I think is a megawatt battery that is, um, you know, coupled with a generator. And, you know, my, my thoughts are, you know, gener trailer mounted generator is great, great solution, um, but, you know, noisy, you need fuel, the heat, um, 
Are you? Do you have any of those um, trader mounted um, batteries for uh, you know supporting the? Um, you know, actually, in the in the actual batteries, but the UPS system side of things we have, but it's a uh, uh, Caterpillar for tradition has been on a, a flywheel. So they, they're basically still taking that uh, uninterrupted power supply and hitting prior to that generator going online. Uh, but I, I hear about a lot of, of battery projects that are going on, but uh, uh, personally, I haven't seen anything so far, but it's great to see an actual microgrids going into California that are, that are been Oshpot approved. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I uh, I'll be joking aside, I, I shot my mouth off so much. They said, well, come and sort of join, you know, in uh, you know, the hospital building safety committee. And I think, you know, I can't do anything unless you can get it approved. So, um, you know, encourage anybody on the call to uh, do that. Um, so just to jump in real quick, uh, if, if, if people haven't noticed, um, Elena and uh, Matt from PGE dropped a few links into the chat. Um, on some of PGE's relevant microgrid programs. Um, and there was a question if an electronic copy of the PowerPoint will be made available. Yeah. I believe so. Yeah. I'll drop it in there. There's hyperlinks as well to a couple of things we talked about. So, um, yeah. It's, uh... All right. Well, that's great presentation, John. Thank you very much. Wow. Yeah, that's that's uh, well received. A lot of good questions. And so thank you all. Um, Beth, it looks like, I don't know if there is any, typically we have those, what do you call the raffle or the door prizes? I don't think you have anything. <laughs> Phil, we don't have anything, Phil, what? this time. <laughs> oh my God, that's the only reason we joined. Get the bottle of whiskey <laughs> and the... Uh... Uh, I don't know, Beth, are you still, anything? No, nothing no. that I've okay. heard of. All right, fantastic. Well, um, thank you all for taking your time. Um, and thank you, John, especially, and Ryan. Um, oh. Wonderful presentation, great topic, and uh, excellent engagement. So um, we'll talk again. We'll make sure this uh, information is shared, uh, recorded, and presentation is available. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you all. Take care. And thank great. you, Beth. Thank Thanks you. all for hosting us. Um, really enjoyed doing it. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, John. Right. Thank you, Ryan. Thank, thank you, guys. Good night. Right. See you, everyone.